Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I'm gonna just read a, the opening of one of the stories. The book's a collection of short stories from 12 different perspectives. Um, and this is from the perspective of the Mortuary Affairs Marine. It's called Bodies. For a long time, I was angry. I didn't want to talk about Iraq, so I wouldn't tell anyone I'd been. And if people knew, if they pressed, I'd tell them lies. There was this Haji corpse, I'd say, lying in the sun. It'd been there for days. It was swollen with gases, the eyes were sockets, and we had to clean it up the streets. Then I'd look at my audience and size them up, see if they wanted me to keep going. You'd be surprised how many do. That's what I did, I'd say. I collected remains, U.S. forces mostly, but sometimes Iraqis, even insurgents. There are two ways to tell the story, funny or sad. Guys like it funny with lots of gore and a grin on your face when you get to the end. Girls like it sad with a thousand yard stare out to the distance as you gaze upon the horrors of war they can't quite see. Either way, it's the same story. This lieutenant colonel who's visiting the government center rolls up, sees two marines maneuvering around a body bag, and decides he'll go show what a regular guy he is and help. As I tell the story, this lieutenant colonel is a large, arrogant bear of a man with fresh pressed camis and a short, tight mustache. He's got huge hands, I'd say, and he comes up to us and says, here, marine, let me help you with that. And without waiting for us to respond or warn him off, he reaches down and grabs the body bag. Then I describe how he launches up as though he's doing a clean and jerk. He was strong, I'll give him that, I'd say, but the bag rips on the edge of the truck's back gate and the skin of the haji tears with it, a big jagged tear through the stomach. Rotting blood and fluid and or uh, organs slide out like groceries through the bottom of a wet paper bag. Human soup hits him right in the face, running down his mustache. If I'm telling the story sad, I can stop there. If I'm telling it funny, though, there's one more crucial bit, which Corporal G had done when he told the story to me for the first time, back in 2004, before either of us had collected remains or knew what we were talking about. I don't know where G heard the story. The colonel screamed like a bitch, G had said, and then he made a weird, high-pitched keening noise deep in his throat like a wheezing dog. <laughs> This was to show us precisely how bitches scream when covered in rotting human fluids. If you get the noise right, you get a laugh. What I liked about the story was that even if it had happened, more or less, it was still total bullshit. After a deployment, there wasn't anybody, not even Corporal G, who talked about the remains that way. Some of the mortuary affairs marines thought the spirits of the dead hung about the bodies. It creeped them out. You could feel it, they'd say, especially when you look at the faces. But it got to be more than that. Midway through the deployment, guys started swearing they could feel spirits everywhere, not just around the bodies, and not just Marine dead, Sunni dead, Shia dead, Kurd dead, Christian dead, all the dead of all Iraq, even all the dead of all Iraqi history, the Akkadian Empire and the Mongols and the American invasion. I never felt any ghosts. Leave a body in the sun, the outer layer of skin detaches from the lower and you feel it slide around in your hands. Leave a body in water, Everything swells, and the skin feels waxy and thick, but recognizably human. That's all. Except for me and Corporal G, though. Everybody in Mortuary Affairs talked about ghosts. We never said any different. In those days, I used to think, maybe I'd handle it better if Rachel stayed with me. I didn't fit in at Mortuary Affairs, and nobody else would want to talk to me. I was from the unit that handled the dead. All of us had stains on our camis. The smell of it gets into your skin. Putting down food is hard after processing, so by the end of the deployment we were gaunt from poor nutrition, sleep deprived from bad dreams and shambling through base like a bunch of zombies, the sight of us reminding Marines of everything they know but never discuss. And Rachel was gone. I'd seen it coming. 
She was a pacifist in high school, so once I signed my enlistment papers, the thing we had going went on life support. She would have been perfect. She was melancholy. She was thin. She always thought about death, but she didn't get off on it like the goth kids, and I loved her because she was thoughtful and kind. Even now, I won't pretend she was especially good-looking, but she listened, and there's a beauty in that you don't often find. Some people love small towns. Everybody knows everybody. There's a real community you don't get in other places. If you're like me, though, and you don't fit in, it's a prison. So our relationship was half boyfriend, girlfriend, half cellmates. For my 16th birthday, she blindfolded me and drove me 20 miles out of town to a high point off the interstate where you watch the road stretch out forever across the plains to all the places we'd rather be. She told me her gift was this, the promise to come back with me someday and keep going. We were so close for two years, and then I signed up. It was a decision she didn't understand much more than I did. I wasn't athletic, I wasn't aggressive, I wasn't even that patriotic. Maybe if you joined the Air Force, she said. But I was tired of doing the weaker thing. And I knew that her talk about the future was just that. Talk. She'd never leave. I didn't want to stay with her, work in a veterinarian's office and be wistful. My ticket out of the Callaway was what passed in our town for first class, the Marine Corps. I told her, what's done is done. It made me feel like a tough guy from a movie. Thanks. two small selections from this novel. This is a World War II novel, um, and it follows the story of a young American woman who enlists as a nurse in the army um, in a field hospital north of Italy after she's learned that her brother, um, who enlisted after Pearl Harbor, was reported missing in that area. Um, and the first section I'll read from is, um, I've decided to, to go gory with Phil. <laughs> um, uh, Juliet and uh, an army psychiatrist are working to, uh, with a battle fatigue patient who is um, effectively sort of catatonic, um, but they find when they administer sodium pentothal, which is what we know as truth serum, um, they can get him to talk about what happened to him on the battlefield. Um, so I'm just going to read, uh, they're, they're sort of in a, in a tent by themselves, um, Juliet, a nurse, uh, Dr. Willard, and his patient, Christopher Barnaby. Um, who, in the course of the story, Juliet learns was was in her brother's squad, so she's particularly interested in finding out, um, get, getting him speaking to see what he knows. <clears throat> the whole company is encamped in a forest one night, Barnaby continued, and Captain comes by to visit the squad. We're all eating dinner, sitting on logs and packs, having a hot stew for the first time in weeks. And suddenly I get up to go take a piss. Captain calls out to me, get yourself the hell out of my eyesight, Barnaby. I don't even want to feel a breeze that touched your crooked cock. He was always saying he didn't want me to contaminate the squad. He liked that word, contaminate. They all liked it. Anyway, I'd gotten used to it, and you gotta do what the captain says, so off I went. It was one of those noisy nights where the sky was crackling. I walked a good five minutes away. I was half unzipped behind a tree when a massive boom tore through the sky, and things started falling through the trees. I could see smoke in the distance. I rushed back to the squad. I thought we were under attack. But by the time I got to where they were all sitting, I heard everyone cheering. I grabbed my bowl and sat down, eating quietly, trying to figure out what had happened. I was spooning it out and came upon these chunks of meat. But something I bit into wasn't cooked, and I spit that thing out, and then I moved my spoon around. Barnaby's knee, limp until now, began to tremble. Your spoon, what happened? I saw him watching me. Who? Him. A tear sprung loose from Barnaby's eye and disappeared behind his gauze. His voice grew quiet, almost a whisper, a child's whisper. Right there in my bowl, he was staring at me. Barnaby hugged himself and began to rock. Willard glanced at Juliet. What was in your mess tin? Barnaby sniffled, the bluest eye I've ever seen. Juliet leaned closer to listen. What did you do, Willard asked. Captain said, Barnaby, swallow that thing. He had a shovel in his hand. All the guys grabbed shovels. Then Captain lifted his shovel, scooped a pile from the ground. It was all boots and arms and hands. One of the hands had a big gold ring on it. Captain set the shovel down and set to tugging it off. It's raining, Jerry's. He laughs. I bent over and puked. Captain said, Barnaby, you don't have the stomach to be here. You should be eating Jerry bastards alive. Then he stuck the finger in his mouth and sucked off the gold ring, holding it out on his tongue. Barnaby's head began to twitch as he spoke. Juliet felt his pulse quicken and signaled Dr. Willard. 
I can't be eating people. I couldn't eat after that. I'm never hungry. Barnaby's breath constricted to short, sharp inhalations, and Willard looked at his watch. Okay, Willard finally said. That's enough for now. Um, and then I'm going to read uh, a very short speech by the chief nurse in the field hospital. Um, she's a little tipsy. Um, she's uh, been running this field hospital um, for over two years. Um, and they have just found a, a leaflet, a propaganda leaflet, um, that is in the novel. I won't read it, um, but it's verbatim. It, you, you wouldn't actually realize that they sort of dropped leaflets that sort of told these crazy stories about um, women back home being seduced by um, Jewish men, bankers, um, who weren't fighting the war, and this was an attempt to, um, uh, you know, upset the men who were fighting and think that their girl girlfriends and wives were going to be um, taken away by the Jews. So um, this is Mother Hen's sort of late night response to that. I used to think, said Mother Hen, her face slack, pulling a flask from her back pocket, that the sheer magnitude of war, the blood and the bone and the loss of life, would somehow erase all of those smaller concerns of heartbreak and betrayal, lust and covetousness, or at the very least idiotic prejudice, scapegoating the Jews, half the doctors who stitched these boys back together are Jewish. And yet this filth, she jabbed her finger at the leaflet, will have its power. I thought the sight of death and the fear of death would make saints of us all, would strip us bare of all want and worry except staying alive and saving lives, and we would rise to the occasion of discovering our own greatness. Just like all the boys who enlisted, they enlisted believing they were deeply courageous, expecting to prove themselves heroes, and here they are, weeping in their beds at what they've now learned of themselves, of humanity. Death, it seems, only makes us all hungrier to live deeply and fully, which in turn means chaotically and cruelly. I don't understand. It's as though we insist on leaving our mark, no matter how messy. All those urges that once seemed fleeting and superficial turn out when we're faced with the possibility of slaughter to be the very essence of us. My nurses finish assisting an amputation, feeling the ruin of a man's life in their hands, and then rush off to fix their hair and find husbands. Men sitting in foxholes fighting to save the whole of Europe and civilization can be brought to tears by this printed rubbish. The thought of girlfriends back home fucking their bosses. Such extremes of emotion coexist within the human beast. At times, I confess, it overwhelms me. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, so, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, here we go, uh, or actually maybe we should start out with the, the New York Times op-ed. So there was, um, I don't know if anybody saw, there was an op-ed recently by Carol Hoffman. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a book coming out which was about, you know, narratives of women in war. Uh, and of course, uh, there are women doing combat roles in, um, uh, did combat roles in Iraq and doing combat roles in Afghanistan, or at least are in combat. Um, and you know, she was a sort of call to have more narratives uh, about women that, that represented that. And in the middle of it, she um, she sort of says, "Oh, you know, there are other stories about like support staff and nurses and such, but that doesn't count." Um, this this narrative certainly counts. Um, and I like, there's a, you open with a quote from uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, a hospital alone shows what war is. And I wonder if you could, if you could comment on that. Um, yeah, I was, um, you know, one of the things I want, you know, if you're writing about World War II and you want to um, put a woman in a war zone, you do not have the option of putting her in combat. <laughs> um, and the op-ed sort of, sort of address the reality of the, how, how recent the history of women in combat has been. Um, but uh, if you wanted to get a woman close to the front lines, you would put her in a field hospital as a nurse. Um, and you're certainly in danger. Oh, absolutely. There were, there were nurses killed um, by bombs, and um, uh, there were some that were kidnapped in Burma. Um, I mean, they were, they were certainly in danger. Um, and again, I'm, you know, the larger question is, you know, is is the experience of, of war dependent on how close you are to danger, or how many people you see dying, you know, what is the, what makes one's role in a war zone important, and certainly in your book, you've, you've gone, um, you've cast a sort of very wide lens on addressing 
characters who are not actively in combat and her and sort of bu bureaucrats and um, you know the uh, at the start of World War II, um, well, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, there were 1,000 nurses on the army rolls, and by the end of the war, there were 60,000. Um, so it, it was an experience that many women had, um, and it was the closest they could get to um, the action. Um, and certainly in the course of this novel, which is not, I mean, it, in some ways I think the scene that I read from is, is maybe the only closest to combat scene, or one of the very few, it's in, it's in Barnaby's memories that he actually um, talks about his combat experiences, but they don't dominate the novel. It is, it is looking at men coming off the battlefield, um, and, and the sort of the wreckage and ruin is sort of avoiding the sort of more traditional heroic moments. Um, but uh, I, you know, what, when I read that op-ed, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, the even now, uh, we talk about women in the military, and we, we do fixate understandably on the on the wonderful um, role that women in combat are now allowed to play. But um, the numbers, e even in our contemporary conflicts, uh, something like sixty percent at least are just in medical um, uh, medical positions and administrative positions. The, the the percentage of women in the military who are in combat is a, is a very small. Um, uh, a, a very um, small representation of all women in the military. So, um, and I think it's possible, and, and, and I think you could speak to this as well in terms of your stories, to depict the nature of war outside of combat. Um, and even when you have in the story that you read from a character like Rachel, um, what you're doing is and looking at people who are intimate with those who are um, in war zones and how that affects them and really, again, looking looking at war not as a privileged experience of someone with a gun, you know, in a certain situation, but all the people who are, um, you know. Right. Well, the, the, you know, there's, there's the combat narrative, um, you know, which is very popular, whether it's sort of the literary fiction treatment of that or, or you know, memoirs like Carnival or American Sniper, or that sort of thing. Um, you know, the kind of fascination that we have with with the frontline soldier, but you know, war is also this kind of huge, you know, industrial scale process with all these kind of complicated and fascinating moving parts. So, what is it, you know, what is it like to be, uh, what is it like to be a chaplain? What is it like to be doing psychological operations? Or uh, what is it like to be a mortuary affairs um, specialist? It's actually a great memoir uh, by female Marine Jessica Goodell, uh, which is precisely about that. And then, you know, she comes back from this very difficult experience and she's in a relationship with an infantryman who's constantly sort of telling her, you know, like, fuck you, you don't have any problems coming from Iraq because you weren't, um, you know, you weren't doing the intensely hard things that I was doing. Uh, and it's this kind of um, very destructive relationship and they're both kind of working through working through things. And I wanted to kind of get into those other those other experiences and angles. And also what does it mean when you come home, right, from that experience? Well also you've you've written and spoken about this issue of um, you know the if within the military you sort of privilege only one subset of people involved in a conflict is saying, well they they were the ones that were really involved. What happens then when you get to civilians who just voted in officials, right? I mean, if you really start to say that you know only only the person who dropped the bomb was responsible and yeah. and should be traumatized, affected, changed by it, and if you're trying to actually say let's let's sort of incorporate into the conversation a sense that we're all participants in some sure. ways and in varying degrees, but that there's a that there needs to be more and and you I think you know in addition to the sort of your collection sort of amazing literary merit. I think there the response there there's something about the stories that really invites the reader in to a, a variety of experiences and invites the reader to participate in a conversation in a way that I think some other literature has sort of um, held readers back and said this is a very particular experience that if you if you haven't had this actual experience you couldn't understand it. Right. It's a sort of you know the um, you know, Wilfred Owen telling Jesse Pope and Dulcet de Cormes, if you had seen 
you know, the soldiers dying, you would never write those Jane Austen poems that you write. Um, uh, Siegfried's just insisting that, you know, uh, you know, there's forever, in, in, you know, inalienable distance between those who had gone through war and those who hadn't. Um, you know, it comes, crops up in Hemingway. Uh, Tim O'Brien, How to Tell the True War Stories, is, um, you know, sometimes it just can't even be told. It can only be sort of experienced. And then, um, and yet, I think that, you know, sort of when we go to war, it's something that we do as a nation. And uh, it's important to open that experience up, not just for, not just because it's an important discussion for us all to be having, and, and, and never more so than, than today when there's so few people who serve. It's an all volunteer military. We send people over and over and over again. Um, and I think it's, it's vitally important for people to think about what that means on a human level. Um, but I think it's also important for those who go through the experience to, to feel like they can communicate that. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a kind of, uh, there's a literary critic who talks about it as, as, as combat Gnosticism. Uh, it's sort of, you know, the mystical experience of going to war and coming back that, that can't be communicated and that um, I think is ultimately sort of problematic, right? Uh, and, and you can have people who go to war, Paul, uh, the lyrical critic Paul Fussell, you know, goes to war and, bait and comes back and sort of writes that if you would experience World War II and how awful it was in the Pacific, you would have known that um, uh, we totally should have dropped the atomic bomb. And then other, you know, veterans go, well, if you had gone into Vietnam and how awful it was, you would have known that you would be an absolute pacifist, right? Um, you, you need to open the conversation more than you need experience. Uh, so that we can all actually kind of engage with the, the moral questions that, that war brings up. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, so I know that you've done work in hospices, right? Yes. And you, you refer to that as both, both a, a, a terrifying experience as well as a privilege. And I, I wanted to know a little bit more about what, what you did and how that informed this work. And, um, yeah, um, as my mother, who's sitting in the audience, can probably attest, I've always loved spending time with old cool people. <laughs> um, and uh, in high school, I volunteered at a nursing home, um, and that made me very comfortable around people at the end of life. And then um, uh, my brother has worked as a paramedic for years, um, and he's very good. He's very good at dealing with death in a sort of gruesome, emergency-oriented. Um, uh, details um, and I think hospice appealed to me because I had found working in a nursing home and I found when I first started doing hospice that there is a there is a sort of um, a beautiful nakedness um, to people there is no pretense when people are dying no one is performing um, no, one, no one is trying to you know create an impression and people people tell the truth um, people care about every moment in a way that um, definitely gets lost along the way. Um, so uh, some of it, um, and again, it's you know it's different from the novel in that um, these the patients that Juliet tends to are younger, um, and uh, their deaths are are sort of more you know more sudden and unexpected, and they're sort of young men trying to cope with what's about to happen to them. Um, but there's a scene in the novel where um, someone that she knows from home, she um, she reencounters him, and he, you know, she remembers him as this sort of, you know, tough athlete. And you know, 200 pages later, she's in a tent. It's her and a chaplain and this guy, um, and he's got, you know, 30 minutes, an hour left to live, and she's there, and she's trying to figure out what to do with that time, and how to comfort him, and. It was probably one of my favorite scenes in the novel to write because it was a moment that, in some ways, sort of stood outside of the larger war narrative and was really just about how you how you um, how you help someone through an experience that um, you couldn't possibly understand. It's the oddest thing to do because, by its very nature, no one who is alive and helping someone die really ever knows exactly what they're feeling, and you. You try your best as a person to muster every <laughs> every bit of kindness and gentleness and 
and thoughtfulness and knowledge to be there. Um, and it's, again, it's scary because it's scary because you think that you're, you're going to do something wrong. Um, I mean, if it's really someone's last moments, you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't, you know, um, you don't want to be insensitive. Uh, and it's an amazing privilege. Um, so I think, I think that doing that gave me, put me in a place of comfort. I don't have nursing experience per se, um, but certainly because her nursing, uh, you know, in a field hospital involves a lot more actually tending to people as they're dying than you would have in an average sort of, you know, hospital setting. Um, made me comfortable in writing that part of her experience, and also, uh, you know, at the start of the novel, you know, she's she's a teenager, she's a very young woman who's sort of thrown into this intense experience, and it allowed me to really um, to watch her grow as a character in a very short space of time. But but it, it's a it's a crash course in, in adulthood for her. Right. Well, you know, she learns a lot. She learns a lot about the body, and there's this. You know, this is passage uh, early on where she's just sort of looking at, you know, all these broken bones and sleeping wounds. Her body seemed precariously fragile. There were bones inside of her. She reminded herself, and on those bones lay strips of muscle tangled with veins and arteries, skin and ligaments held it together. The entirety of the mass of flesh she called herself. The same delicate pieces made up everyone with the wrong pieces or too many pieces broke. The whole person ceased to exist. She witnessed it daily for months, and yet the strangeness of it never subsided. Um, and that that relationship to the body, as well as you know, she's a, she's a young woman, and her introduction to a certain part of the male anatomy is dealing with all these STD cases in uh, Naples, which I'm sure was something that a lot of nurses had to deal with. Yeah. Yes, I always um, you know the, the recruitment posters you know turns out for nurses so the. Um, the efforts that were made to get, you know, to go from 1,000 to 60,000 nurses during World War II had a lot to do with these very, you know, portraits of beautiful women and, and phrases like, you know, save his life and find your own. And, um, and then you read the actual accounts and you can only imagine how disheartening it would be to be a young woman um, and, you know, perhaps inexperienced, um, uh, you know, in some ways, um, and to show up and be assigned to basically, you know, inspect the male anatomy <laughs> um, day after day, you know, hour after hour, and, and that might um, that might affect your enthusiasm for <laughs> <laughs> other things. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the uh, you know um, you mentioned before. Uh, Sort of question of you know representing the experience. And I was curious in terms of the book has been out for a month now. Yeah. Um, and obviously you know a lot of veterans. There are yeah. people who are, may or may not have been part of the process of the writing or, or looking at the stories. And I'm curious um, what um, response you've gotten from from veterans or active military. Uh, yeah. You know people. Uh, so far, it's been very good. Uh, you know, I was I was very worried while writing the book. I kind of wrote it in a constant state of terror um, because it was very important to me to get, you know, to get the book right, as right as I could, and uh, to speak about these things as honestly as I could, and sometimes as brutally honestly as I could. Um, and that meant dealing with a lot of ugly things, right? Uh, you know, uh, you know, empathetically and trying to understand it from the inside, but not sugarcoating anything. And so I, I assume that that I would get, I think, more pushback than I actually than I actually have. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody out there who hates me, but um, I haven't met that guy yet. Maybe they're here. <laughs> um, uh, Bill. <laughs> um, but um, I think, you know, there's a weird way in which there's this kind of bizarre conversation that's going on and, and, and you know, you, when, this is not the, the Vietnam generation, right? Uh, I think, you know, veterans have come back to a lot of, a lot of goodwill. The conversation sometimes get, gets very weird, particularly around PTSD. There was a, a pretty vile Huffington Post article that just came out, which was like, the aftermath of war. And then it was, you know, all the locations where uh, veterans had committed um, murders, right, acts of violence, and you look at the map, and you're like, my God, 
Except then you do the math and you're like, my God, the veteran murder rate is so much lower than the normal murder rate. Um, so anyway, I think that because it's, a lot of veterans have thanked me for writing the book. Um, and I think that it's, it's, you know, if you've been told that you're a hero enough times, um, it's very nice, right? But you also, I think one of the things that you really want coming back is for people to be really seriously engaged with the experience. Um, and I've encountered that from World War II veterans, too, who, who feel like the, the way in which World War II is, is talked about sometimes um, doesn't map onto their experience. Even if they're proud of what they did, that, that you know, war can be a very ugly thing. Uh, and your book is certainly a very different uh, take on the experience of, of World War II. It seems in some ways written, you know, in counter to, just a counterpoint to so many of the, the narratives that we hear. Well, and one of the things, you know, I, when I started the book in 2003, it was really this question of, okay, how to, how to explore the topic of war and try to depoliticize the conflict. And World War II seemed to be the, you know, the conflict that everybody sort of agreed was, you know, it was an okay war for us to be in. You know, yeah. we sort of got dragged into it. We were basically happy with the outcome. Um, and I had found um, in my research and a lot of the, um, you know, it was interesting starting in 2003, a lot of the material that I was looking at was a lot of sort of self-published memoirs, um, letters, and things that very quickly seemed to go against what I had believed was the sort of overall World War II experience as a sort of as a well thought theme war outside of the issues of dropping the bomb, which is sort of what everybody fixates on is whether or not that was right or wrong. Um, and when you looked more um, intimately at the individual experiences and things that people were starting to talk about, which I think people started to talk about because of the conversations going on about our contemporary conflicts. There's more openness about saying it's okay to talk about these bad things that happened in the course of war. Um, and I've become very interested in there are, you know, mistreated prisoners. There's a, there's a lot of sort of bad stuff that goes on in the sort of smaller moments um, in the book. And then I was very happy when I read your um, Daily Beast article about your experience, um, you know, with a World War II veteran showing you that photograph, and I think that's a worthwhile to Yeah, it's, the, it's one of the most horrific war stories I've ever been told. Um, actually, my friend Adam uh, invited me to the party for uh, sort of um, a couple of World War II veterans, and one of them took out a, a, a photograph. Um, uh, of a woman who had been raped and killed by our soldiers. And, um, you know, it's, it's a sort of, you know, you meet a, a, a World War II veteran at a, at a party um, honoring them. Uh, he's a great guy. The, the sort of image of World War II that you're expecting, you're not prepared for that kind of story. Um, but of course, <laughs> If that's something that you saw, um, that would stay in your mind, and, and you know, you, you it will color your perception of that of that experience, uh, along with all the other things. You know, when I talked to him, you know, he, he was he was very clear. He said, you know, war ruined my life. Um, you know, I had friends killed in front of me, next to me. I don't know how I survived, uh, and for a long, long time, I didn't I didn't know how to be with people. Um, and that's, and then, you know, if there's a particular narrative of, of, the, of the conflict that doesn't fit, how do, you, how, do you, how do you then begin that conversation, right? How do you then begin to talk about the things that really weigh on you, that are difficult and complicated, and, and, and need patience and time to sort of work that out with other people? Um, so, yeah. It was a real, um, you know, after World War II, a real sort of whitewashing of uh, this, you know, soldiers are coping with their experiences. And John Houston who made this film, Let There Be Light, um, a documentary about um, some veterans in a psychiatric hospital trying to sort of um, recover from what we now call PTSD. Um, and the army censored it. It was, you know, it was censored. There was a screening at MoMA decades later. The army came in and took the real. Um, 
I mean, there was such a, the culture was so different. I mean, you, you cannot, you know, turn on your computer nowadays without seeing some article about PTSD. Um, perhaps, you know, we can talk about, perhaps maybe we've, again, gone too far in the other direction, um, where uh, you, you have one of, one of my favorite stories um, is where the playwright is interviewing a veteran, um, what's the title of that story? Uh, war, war stories. War stories, war stories. So there's a lot in, in, in Phil's collection about storytelling. Um, and again, a lot um, about how people who have had these experiences um, come home and interact with, with characters who haven't. And um, there's a playwright who's come to a bar. She's, she's trying to get him to tell his story. Um, he has a, a, a burn, a, a, a terrible um, burn scar. Uh, and every time he's sort of on the cusp of saying something and trying to really describe his personal feelings about the experience, she sort of jumps in and says, PTSD. You know, this sort of very quick right. answer to, um, you know, to explain away um, and kind of bottle and box up his experience. Right. I mean, it's, it's sort of become a, a catch-all, right? So, mass shooting with PTSD. Well, veterans with PTSD actually commit fewer acts of premeditated violence than veterans without, but, um, you know, uh, a whole mess of things, right? Uh, and there's, you know, the kind of assumption that a lot of us have PTSD, uh, even if we don't, which is disturbing for a couple of reasons. One, because actual PTSD is very real, very serious. Um, and then there's also a way in which there are a lot of sort of different issues um, you know, it's sort, of, it's sort of like, are you angry? Are you sad? Uh, are you confused and lost and alienated? Well, maybe that's PTSD. Or maybe it's just the fact that, you know, if you're a veteran in today's wars, you know, you, you're seeing your friends go off on sometimes fifth, sixth, seventh deployments and getting killed in a conflict that barely makes the news, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, maybe that's the appropriate reaction. Uh, that you know that doesn't feel like a medical condition. I, th I think sometimes the conversation about about PTSD it, 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 it's sort of used to kind of explain away things without actually adding to the conversation. I think that uh, both for those with with PTSD and also for a broader understanding of what veterans go through and the, the complicated mix of issues that are that are a part of it. Um, it's worth it's worth piecing those out, right? Mm -hmm. And can you um, talk a little bit um, this issue of like, both of our books are exploring issues of masculinity mm -hmm. um, uh, in very different ways, um, but there's a there's there was a sort of sense of um, familiarity I had when I was reading your collection um, about trying to create a space in between the war hero. And the sort of the traumatized victim, um, right. and you know, to what degree, to what degree, when you were writing your stories, was that something that you, because you know, the the, the motif of storytelling um, and how people tell their stories and who owns the stories is very sort of um, uh, strong in the collection. And I think the issue of masculinity is sort of done much more subtly. And so I'm wondering if that's something that kind of um, emerged as you were writing, if it was a subject that you were interested in, had you talked to, <laughs> you know, other men about this? Well, you know, um, I mean, first of all, is supposed to be one of the things that makes you a man, right? Um, you know, it's how you prove yourself. Uh, which then gets interesting when women start doing some of the same things that are supposed to make you a man. Um, the the other thing is it's just you know the Marine Corps is you know take uh, the thousands of eighteen year olds um, and put them on a military base uh, where they have number of women ten to one um, you know it's kind of a petri dish for all sorts of expressions of, of both masculine virtues and masculine pathologies, uh, and so you know you can't be in the Marine Corps and not think about uh, think about that and what it means, and also what you know the way that the way the guys talk about women in the Marine Corps, the way that they think about it, and the way they think about masculinity, it all comes from American culture. It's just you know 
shot up with steroids. And so you get to look at some things that are particularly apparent uh, when you've got, you know, a bunch of young Marines talking about women or talking about, you know, masculinity or what it means to be a man. Uh, that are just kind of amped up versions of, of, of the same stuff that we're dealing with uh, in, in American culture as a whole, and that's just interesting to me. Yeah, your characters, um, again, you know, when I spoke to this this issue of a sort of story collection that really invites readers in, um, it's interesting because the, the collection will sort of have that, it, it sort of documents that attitude towards women, and there's the, you know, in Vietnam they had whores, um, and a sort of, uh, sort of, the passage that just kind of sort of slaps you in the face as you read it, um, where uh, a, a, a father has told his son the story of his um, experience in Vietnam and a, a sort of a trick that the sort of prostitutes would do with sort of picking up quarters, stacks of quarters um, between their legs, and, and uh, another character sort of setting a lighter to it, um, to the stack of quarters. And, um, yeah. and it's a really, you know, um, it's a moment that sort of so quickly depicts one version of masculinity, one version of getting depraved sort of um, behavior in that situation, and yet um, the characters, the sort of characters that you sort of ask the readers to really ally themselves with. Um, I think even in the passage you read the description of Rachel. You know, she was she was thoughtful. She was a good listener. There's a there's a great sense of um, respect for women and kindness towards them, and um, I love uh, the story where um, the, the guy's girlfriend is that is that also Rachel? Is that from that story? Has sent the photos that yes, he right. um, has sent these sort of titillating photos um, that the routine is is that all the sort of guys sort of pass around and share, and he's in this act of chivalry trying to eat the photos before um, the other guys can get a look at them. And it's very sweet, you know, and and so that there's a sort of a space to represent um, a, a range of attitudes, and and for me that was a very um, a new experience in reading war fiction, um, where women could be present in the fictional world, and they were not, um, you know, as a sort of corollary to real life, the 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 success of creating interesting complicated male characters was not dependent on diminishing the women characters. Um, well, you know, this is something that, it, I know that you, you had your, your arguments with Hemingway, <laughs> and um, there's a nurse, uh, you sort of talked about how there's, you know, the nurse in, in Farewell to Arms, and, and the role that she functions in the narrative. Um, and this, this book, you, you had Hemingway in mind while you were writing this. Um, could you talk a little bit about that particular argument? I mean, yeah, I mean, I love I love that novel. I think it is a beautiful. Um, I think it's one of his best novels. Um, that said, like a lot of Hemingway, um, there are moments, uh, there are ways in which characters, and often the female characters, do not feel to me like they behave in a sort of um, lifelike, interested in a complicated way, and of course, Catherine Barkley is a nurse. Um, but she is more like the poster of the world, you know, she's this sort of beautiful, you know, soft focus, um, devoted nurse uh, who, whose sort of death at the end is sort of meant to, in some ways, depict the horrors of war. It's, very, it's, very, it's actually a very odd novel in many ways. It's a war novel. It's a, it's a romance. Um, and uh, he's a deserter. It, it, it doesn't sort of follow, it doesn't follow the sort of typical um, lines of, uh, of, of masculinity uh, in the way that he picks the character, but, but I always felt like she was a character who was very interesting to me and did not come across or come alive in the text. Um, and, and I really wanted to, um, I wanted to have a nurse who actually did nursing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and she was actually, like I said, working and was not, was not in the story as a love interest. Um, and, you know, wh one of the interesting things is that, um, and, and it's questionable whether or not Hemingway is truly considered a veteran writer. I mean, his, his participation mm -hmm. 
was minimal compared to other veteran writers in terms of his ambulance driving. Um, but uh, it's very interesting to me that a lot of men, um, and particularly non-veterans, uh, have approached war often as a backdrop for a romantic story. Mm -hmm. um, I think much more so than women. And, and again, not in the way that veterans typically do it. it it's, um, so, and in a way I'm not sure women can get away with as easily. There's, some, there's something about Hemingway doing that. <laughs> and I mean, again, he's, he, you know, he's, he's a perfect writer. Um, but it's a, it's a form that, that we allow um, men to, to do that when women do it, it's sort of like, oh, that's a, you know, that's a romance rather than a war novel. Right. James Jones said of Hemingway, you know what really destroyed Hemingway? The Second War when all the boys found out what war actually was. Um, I, I like Hemingway. Um, uh, if there are any questions, I think, um, we'd be happy. So, uh, you said that when you were writing, you, you used the word terror. Yeah. You used the word terror to describe how you felt about trying to put, um, you know, put together your stories. So, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about why specifically that was, and what did that feel like? To be terrorized <laughs> by, by you know, by the idea of of writing when you're writing that. I mean, I, also, I don't want to make it sound so agonistic, but um, what I was writing was important to me. But I also knew that, that talking about these experiences was important to to other people as well. You know, that if if um, you know, somebody who did more Troy Affairs and has a lot of really intense feelings about that and what that experience was, if they read that particular story, um, I want to be comfortable with what I'm saying about it, right? And the only way that I can do that is just by, by writing it as, as, as sort of rigorously as I can. Um, you know, because you can't, These, you know, if you're writing about war, especially current war, I, I, you, you, it matters. It just matters. The, the, the stories that we tell ourselves about war, um, I mean, you know, here's a story about war. Um, uh, it would be read as liberators and rapidly transition things over to Iraqi security forces, right? That's a story that got people killed, right? Like, it, you know, it, it's... The way that we talk about these things has real life has real consequences for people's lives, and, and the way that we think about veterans that makes a difference every time somebody interacts with a veteran, and, and the way in which they interact with them and what they expect of them. Um, and so I felt like if I'm going to write about this subject, I need to feel that 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 terror at points because I needed to propel me to 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 write something better to write something less lazy. And also, I, I had a lot of help. I, I, you know, I, I sent it out to friends and, and just kind of constantly got beat up over how poorly I'd, I'd written uh, you know, the experience or the women characters. Or, uh, I had, thanks, Lauren. Um, you mentioned just now um, the challenge of writing about the current war. Uh, there will undoubtedly be a lot more writers writing about Iraq and Afghanistan after the war's end and the years that follow as they process it. What does it mean to you to be one of the first? Um, I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's been a privilege, right? But I don't think, I think we're going to be thinking about these things for a long time. I mean, I think we still need more books about World War II, right? I mean, um, and my general sense is the more voices in the room, the more, the more smart, serious voices in the room, uh, the better we are, right? And, and you know, the more, the more folks that, um, you know, the better, the sort of richer understanding we have of what that meant, which matters, right? 
Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, you probably wrote about World War II for similar reasons, because there was something that hadn't been said yet that you felt needed to be said there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, it was closer to closer to what's going on now. And, and yeah. Jennifer, you talked about doing research with the process. What was your relationship to that material as you wrote the book? Did you keep going back to it? Or at some point did you have to distance <coughs> yourself from it once you uploaded it into your brain and then sort of make it your own through the writing? Um, yeah. I very naively, my first novel was called Easter Island, it was set on Easter Island, and by the time that book came out, I had read, I have read everything ever written about Easter Island. Um, and so I thought, this is how you write a novel, and I, you know, approached World War II with an initial stack, um, and it, you know, and I suddenly realized that the volume of material um, about World War II, you, you really couldn't read in your lifetime. So. Once I narrowed it down to setting the, the book in, you know, 44 in Italy, north of Rome, um, I was able to, um, after I want to say maybe two or three years, just set it all aside and really not go back to it until I, I had to fact check at the end because I think especially when you, when you get in your head that you are representing other people's experiences um, rather than creating a story. Um, it's very dangerous because you feel this sort of obligation. If you know, if I came across a, a, something that was so interesting that I wanted to, I wanted the world to know that this thing had happened or could happen. Um, there was so much that was so rich, um, but it can, it can, and for me, in sort of the draft process, it would get in the way of this particular story. Um, and my hope is that it, it seeped in once it was set aside in a way that does come out. In my family, there was a tremendous reluctance by one of my uncles to discuss his war experiences. I had a father and three uncles who fought in the Second World War. And my father, although he was the oldest, had no actual war experience because of his age and, and having started a young family during the war and being deferred. So he served in the States. But his younger brother, was sent uh, to the Pacific Theater. For his entire life, he refused to fly. And that included when he and my father were in business together for decades. No one ever discussed this with us. Um, and I found out after his death that he was served so many plane crashes in the Far East, in the Pacific, that he was terrified. It affected his relationship with my father when they were in business, he wouldn't fly on business. Uh, I think it affected a lot of things. Um, the veterans of that war did not want to talk about it. And when I think of all those decades that went by, he only he died in the last five years, so did my father. Both of them well up in years. Um, things have changed a great deal in all those years. Yeah, I mean that's, yeah, very frequently you find that. I mean, you know, and I think it depends on the, uh, it depends on the veteran. Frequently the they'll, veterans will open up to other veterans first, I think, because there's, you know, there are certain things that you can, you can rely on get certain touchstones the other person might know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, uh, yeah, you meet, you know, you meet folks from, you know, where, even trying to talk about the Korean War just kind of stops them. Uh, and it's a uh, long trail sometimes. Well, I think this also goes to the issue of war and manhood. And I think certainly for that generation, there was a sense that it must seem like the obligation was not to trouble other people with what I mean. This, this story is really familiar. And almost every event I've done for this book, someone has said a similar thing about my, my father, you know, someone in the family served in World War II, and I don't know anything about what they actually did because they never talked about it. Um, and there was clearly, there was clearly um, a sort of, a sort of understanding that, that that was, that that was part of it to sort of not, um, to not upset other people. Um, and, but what's interesting too though is that I think I, I do think that the, a combination of factors, one is that that generation um, is, is passing away, and I think there, there has been 
um, even in the last decade, and I found in my research a, a desire, a lot of people do want to tell their stories, and it's really just coming out as people realize that their time is limited. Um, also, I think that, like I said, the conversations that we've been able to have about what goes on in war zones now, I think might have allowed people who are veterans of that conflict to feel more comfortable talking about it. Um, and it's interesting, too, that we even have, we both, you know, um, uh, know of um, deserters and, and what soldiers do, that even on a, even historians are now in an odd way. I mean, I, I don't know why, why decades after World War II we finally get the book, you know, What Soldiers Do About Allied Soldiers, you know, Reaping Women in France, and a book from, about just the phenomenon of desertion during World War II. I mean, presumably all this information was there and accessible along the way, but it's, it's now, again, it's sort of entering the conversation in a way that people are more comfortable with, and it's very, it's very unfortunate. It's a, you know, I don't know if we'll ever really have an accurate record of World War II because of the, the lack of communication from the people who are actually participating in it most sort of intensely and intimately because they didn't tell their stories. There's no question it affected my life, and my father's as well. They were in business together. Uh, my uncle was used to travel, and eventually the business broke up, just they were still for 20 years. And we re never really understood the dynamics. Yeah. I feel it's a great book. Um, I, I think one of the issues, the difference between the World War II generation and this generation is the question of the veterans do not want to talk about it because the veterans of World War II felt that they were either drafted or they enlisted very early on, but they were doing a job they wanted to get on with it and they wanted to. And it's, it's, I, I've done over a thousand interviews with World War II veterans, and the issue is, is that, in fact, they are now, and it's the end, you're, you're absolutely correct. They're just, it's flooded. Um, and in fact, after you've interviewed somebody, they call you over and over and over again to talk about it. In fact, I'm going back with one when we were talking about uh, He's a great guy. He's a phenomenal guy. Uh, and then going back to Norman, we went to the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And, and uh, the difference, I think, is that your generation volunteered and was part of a very small group that volunteered. It's like cops talking about being cops. There's a very small group of cops. Yeah. There's a very small group of, you know, uh, cancer surgeons who can talk about cancer, the trauma of cancer surgery or whatever. World War II was 16 million Americans and a population of 120 million. Uh, and the 60,000 there's the very, very many women who, who worked in, on the home front who were as involved mentally as, in, as it was going on in combat, and many, many more. Who, who lived it through their family who was out there. But they came back, I believe, saying, I did a job, I did what I had to do. I really don't want to talk about it. I've interviewed a lot of Holocaust survivors and it's the same attitude. They don't want to talk about it. But at the end of their life, it reaches a point, it's a fascinating moment in their 80s where they suddenly say, oh my God, nobody's going to hear my story. And it floods. Well, there's, there's, there's also, you know, there's um, one of the things soldiers talk about is the length of time it took to bring guys back. So they, they had sort of time talking with other veterans about what they've been through versus sort of getting on a plane and all of a sudden being in America and being like, what the hell is going on? Um, you know, there's a great bit by uh, Sam Hines about going to college after World War II and, you know, like, uh, uh, I forget one of the state colleges that he's at, and they were like trying to throw up extra dorms because they all be all these GI Bill guys coming in, and how they, you know, all the all the folks who've been in service were wearing, you know, they wear, you know, different things depending on what unit they are, and they all sort of know, and they hung out with each other, and there's this very strong community that they had, versus the story I hear time and time again from from guys is, you know, I, I went to call, I heard another one today, but. Not a went to college and he was like, yeah, I'm surrounded by 18-year-old kids and they tell a story and 
it's like, oh, that's cool, and I tell the story, and they're like, people are like, holy shit. Um, I mean, that's a very different, that's just a very different experience, you know? So I think that, you know, the point that you made about the, just the sheer numbers um, <coughs> is very true. Do you feel that you're sort of in some ways isolated as a veteran of the, the Iraq and Afghanistan, that in fact it is such a small group, the rest of us drive around not thinking about anything, uh, but the small group of American kids that went off to war and volunteered, particularly after 9-11, is tiny. Yeah. One percent, well, less than one percent. Well, now I have a, a, I mean, a community of, of vets in New York that I know, and I've also sort of, I've got a community of civilians and, you know, sort of settled into a new life. I think that that transition is something that, that every vet has to go through, right? Because uh, you go from having this sort of very intense community and shared sense of purpose um, to not having that and, and, and not, maybe not being around a lot of people who, uh, you know, know what that's like. Um, and then the other the other thing that I think is is really important is just if you, you know if you got out in you know I got out in two thousand nine right and you know, went up to New York um, and you can just live a life that doesn't feel like it's at war at all right but you've got you've got friends who are going over um, and sometimes bad things happen to them right. And, and what, do you, what do you do with that? Uh, what do you do with that knowledge that you decided to get out? Um, what do you do with the fact that you're in a society that is ultimately responsible for the fact that we're at war? Um, but it just doesn't seem like it, like it matters to them. I, you know, I met a journalist um, who talked about it. He's like, I was embedded in Afghanistan. Uh, last year, and just recently, I found myself talking about the war like it was old, like it wasn't going on. And it's like, if I'm doing that, what are the rest of us doing, right? And I think that a lot of vets very keenly feel that that disconnect, um, you know. And that's I think that's a big difference. And of course, I think that's one of the things that makes us want to talk about it. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time, but please give a warm applause.